serious scientific questions to answers to hypothetical questions. Uh, so once uh, everything is ready, we'll just start this session. <coughs> Manish, you loaded your presentation there. Just two minutes. The first uh, talk of this session is uh, by my dear friend uh, Dr. Manish. He's going to speak on imaging biomarkers and AMD, ARMD. And the question here is everything is a question, basically, and lot all questions uh, here we have a definitive answer. So that's why the session's name is uh, it's more of a hypothetical questions, and we are trying to give you a scientific answer. So that's how the whole format of this meeting is going to be. Dr. Manish. Thank you, Rohit, for this uh, interesting concept on the biomarkers uh, that you've asked me to talk about in AMD. And um, as we all know that in uh, healthy macula, there's a lot of nutritional transfer which happens across the RP Brooks barriers. And as uh, aging takes place, wear and tear takes place, you have deposits of the drusens which leads to the dry AMD and then the soft drusens, and then at times you have the leakage in the vessels growing in and which causes the neovascular membranes and which is what uh, causes a lot of visual uh, disability for the patients which we treat. So there is an apparent lack of sensitive and robust biomarkers for the management of uh, this AMD and we probably need to have more customized guidelines rather than have too many general uh, guidelines that we work on because every patient, every eye uh, behaves a little differently. So there are a lot of uh, tools that we use. There are certain general ones which we have been using for many years and there are some which are constantly advancing and giving us new information. The color pictures, of course, we've learned from a long time of how to interpret a drusen and the possibility of drusen going into a AM, wet AMD or a soft drusen uh, having a more preponderance to go into a wet AMD or a severe visual loss. And then there's autofluorescence, which gives you images and how when you interpret them, looking at the hyperfluorescent, hypofluorescent areas, uh, you look at uh, those spots which tell you that in the future, the same areas will go on to increase in atrophy. And it is quite proven uh, by a lot of uh, work done by the imaging people in this field. And then there's fluorescein and ICG angiography, which have their specific interpretation, which uh, one can look at where is the active leak, uh, where is the recurrence, uh, and then, then look at the predictive outcome of where that lesion is uh, going to head to. So there is fluorescein, this is ICG, there is also a combination of fluorescein and ICG we use in certain cases uh, where there is blood masking uh, the central area and you look at a hot spot or a, or a feeder vessel channel which opens up uh, on an ICG. So we've learned over a period of time that in, in what uh, conditions what we use to initially establish a diagnosis and then see what is the predictive value of that diagnosis in terms of how it leads up. And then there's OCT, which has got a lot of biomarkers which have been studied over all these years. Uh, I won't go into the details of all of them, but things like central retinal thickness, a PED, uh, or a pigmentary epithelial change, shifts, all those, lot of things, atrophic changes, how the layers behave, have been used for predictive uh, outcomes uh, or recurrences in these uh, cases. So that have been there. And here again you'll see a lot of changes which have been published related to how the pigment epithelium layer uh, atrophy at certain places and how it leads up to uh, progression at times. And then of course there is um, choroidal thickness which is very important. Now our OCT allows you to do uh, a deep evaluation where the choroidal thickness is now noted well and it's well known that the healthy eyes have a thicker choroid compared to as you go on towards a pathologic uh, AMD eye. So now we come to the new uh, OCT, uh, OCT angiography based one because this is something which has come up in the last few years. So till now we were working more on the OCT 
uh, and then the OCT angiography is now showing you different dimensions where you, you can see vasculature at different planes uh, from a superficial to deep level and which is giving us a new understanding. And of course, it's a new understanding. We still don't know how to totally interpret it, but, but a lot of learning is happening. So this is an active vasculature which is treated and it disappears uh, with an anti-VEGF uh, molecule. And, in, and that's how the vasculature is apparent with OCTA. So when we say OCTA-based imaging biomarkers for uh, activity, uh, which show activity are the CFAN morphology, secondary branching, peripheral arcades, perilegional loops. So all these have been mentioned by a uh, lot of investigators, especially a lot of work with Sada and uh, Saraf. They've been bringing up a lot of data on these things. And if you look at inactivity, there's large dilated straight vessels, absent secondary branching, lower peripheral arcades, and so on and so forth. So does the lack of fluid uh, mean on the OCT means absence of uh, CNV or does activity persist despite lack of fluid? So when you look at OCT and you are retreating, these are the questions uh, which come to your mind when a patient keeps coming back to you uh, with visual complaints. So, so OCTA is further defining, helping us look at aspects beyond just the OCT itself. So there are long-term evaluations of the type 1 CNV which could be growth rates, growth patterns, growth forms. Uh, when you look at the, the growth rates, the doubling is, is seen, even as you treat these patients, there's a doubling of the, the actual vasculature that you see, or there is a modest growth uh, that you see instead of the one you saw before, or there could be an, a frank reduction of the CNV. So we see all these formats which are happening and we are still understanding what the predictive value of uh, seeing any one frame at a given point in a patient means in the long run. Then there's three growth patterns which could be symmetric, uh, something like this where there's a symmetric increase uh, or there could be an asymmetric increase where it's not growing in all directions in the same symmetric fashion. And then there are finger-like projections which are podia-like uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the projections which come up in these patients. So all these are, are differently presenting features. Or the growth forms, which could be immature, mature, and hypermature, something like this. Uh, you have various divisions of these immature forms. Or there could be maturity, which has a modest stable growth and is supposed to be more resistant to the anti-VEGF uh, therapy uh, in these. Or hypermature, where there is large straight vessels, dead tree appearance, and inactive uh, growth. So these are uh, the further biomarkers. This is just to explain one of our patients who we were treating for the other eye. Uh, had these sort of changes on the OCT, you see these bumpy excrescences near the pigment epithelium. OCTA showed these dark, uh, darkish spots. And then over the next few months, even though we were not treating this eye, it went on to develop a, a PD with fluid around and, and some changes of vasculature that we started seeing on the OCTA. And then we gave anti-VEGF and, and there was a bit of a regression uh, which we could see. But again, uh, there was a recurrence and you can see that uh, it, it kind of regressed and then again as we were treating at some point uh, the recurrence started and there was another front which came up. So uh, what I mean to say is that we still don't know. It's not as straightforward that you give injections and it's, uh, of course the patient responds but we don't know that is this the end point or is this an, a new vasculature sometimes comes as a part of recurrence or is the same one which is opening up. So short term biomarkers may show correlation with disease activity with poor predictive value while long term biomarkers may provide more reliable uh, biomarkers of neovascularization activity. We put some of our work in uh, Retina today some time back. Uh, I don't have much experience with this. I think the Naranitra people have adaptive optics and there is a lot of mention of this work where the Photoreceptors are looked at with, uh, in a lot of these conditions, especially AMD and, and looking at the health of the, 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 the photoreceptors and predicting uh, the, the functional part of it, how they respond to a stimuli uh, during the test and, and would predict what it leads up to in the long run. To conclude, there is a distinct need to identify sensitive and robust imaging biomarkers for individualized prognosis of AMD, which would help clearly define endpoints of treatments and retreatments. And to end with, I just want to show you a small clip of this friend of mine from Vienna who does a lot of work on uh, software imaging of all these OCTs and three-dimensional ones. And, and he was showing a few years back a choreo capillary uh, which was rendered in 3D uh, from the data captured on OCT. Uh, and, and, and he could go and from that data create this whole network where you are actually going inside and looking at the health of the choreocapillaries and, and, and looking at uh, 
uh, how thick or thin they are, what is the passage like, what is the lumen like. So, so there's a lot of stuff which uh, is in the offing where imaging is concerned. We probably, what we know is just the tip of the iceberg, even though there's a lot of stuff which is around. But the more we know, I think it's going to help us in the future with um, trying to do these treatments to a more customized manner as well as uh, when to consider retreatments in times of dilemma uh, when a patient has a fluid or not, uh, which is there or not there based on the visual acuity and symptoms. Uh, thank you very much. Good. Yes. Yeah. You showed a patient, Adalai, who developed, who had a Ducin, soft Ducin, and in follow-up, he developed a new oscillation. So as we had been following the patient for the last many, many years for the, that other eye, which was uh, not having good vision, imaging does not only help to get the exact diagnosis, but I feel th learning from the other eye, we could set a pattern of treatment also so that we could save that same problem in the other eye. Because page, to tell the patient that, the same problem has occurred in spite of your frequent watching is very, very embarrassing to us as yes. a retina specialist. Yes, no, I agree. But, but our understanding so far doesn't allow us to treat uh, that eye because we don't see an active membrane, active fluid. Do you feel fluid. there's any genetic yeah. biomarkers <coughs> yes. for these patients yes. who already have a disease Absolutely. in one eye? Yes. So we need to find out what is that marker in that patient which brought on the, the activity in the few months that you were treating the other eye. Uh, is where the question mark is. Yes. Another hall giving a talk. If you have a perfect uh, imaging tool, like I'm asking a hypothetical question, what would be your biomarker? You showed that capillary thing, but those are just a great image. But yeah. But in your present scenario, what would you? What would be your biomarker? Uh, the present scenario would be, I think. Uh, it would be asking too much if we have a predictive value for both eyes to go on to develop something. But <clears throat> I think if one eye has a pathology which we know is bilateral, if possible. So we need to define a biomarker through the active eye to determine the minor changes which happen in the other eye, that whether they will definitively or almost definitely go in for something. So there should be something on that image based on that um, so-called perfect tool which um, tells us that info. But I'm not sure that I could expect something that, that in a totally normal eye, it's, it's too far. I mean, that would be great to know that, that uh, this healthy eye is going to go into an AMD or, or, or um, uh, IPCV or something. We, I don't know if that is possible. Maybe in the future, yeah. But today, given the whole scenario, the information, I think we should be able to get on to some sort of an imaging where the other eye prediction could be done. Uh, Manish, I have a suggestion. If we look into the epithelial... Uh, or the rod and cone function at watching a ERG because we have a new machine which can predict the ERG function of a normal retina. So these predictive values of ERG can also help, I think, for the future progression of the disease in the other eye. Right. See, one of the things uh, for any prediction, if you, the best example is what was published few days back. Uh, they've been able to look at the vasculature of the eye and predict the heart attack. To get that prediction, they have uh, done two lakhs three three two lakhs thirty eight thousand eyes of patients having heart attacks and uh, vasculature. Yeah, yeah. So they build this into a big data system, and then it went into an uh, uh, an algorithm, and to do, and then it can start predicting. Like we so do know that ischemia is one of the triggering points for the wedge activity, which leads to the neovascular component. So if we have a biomarker which tells us that there is an onset of ischemia there uh, which is what in the future is going to lead up to a membrane I think that would tell yeah. us a lot more rather than just looking at um, RPE or like just the layers which of course happen at a secondary stage yeah. what we are looking is already the damage is uh, already in progress yeah. but the initial stimulus is based on ischemia Changes. somewhere yeah, yeah. finally it boils down to genetics like if you, yes. you may have all kinds of markers, but you may never develop an ARMD because your genes are protecting you. And you may have a very small marker then. So the holistic approach of connecting all would be like what you're doing now, would be the way to move forward in the next sure. decade. Sure. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Yes, sir. Be ready. Yeah. Uh, 
Rohit is the guy. <laughs> He's already No, the, the only thing that, is, yeah. uh, see, the question is, behavior changes would be, smoking is linked to your ARMD directly, the nicotine. So I'm not really sure whether alcohol of any sort is linked. Because I know wine, the, the component in wine actually promotes healing better. Uh, this is what we published. Uh, I don't remember the name. It starts with R. I don't know if somebody can remember that name. So wine is actually a protector. But you need gallons of wine to protect you against the, the not... But when you have gallons of wine, you'll anyway see fuzzy for that <laughs> time. So. so that is one thing about it. But smoking, yes. And if you stop some... And uh, the new uh, components of ARDS, I don't know how, how, much believe, how, many, how much you believe in that. The oral supplements, do you give them? Well, but it's more of a placebo. See, all the guidelines, uh, the what they suggest, the amount of antioxidants that they actually need is is practically impossible for the patient to take, uh, is what is the problem. Because what we give is actually a very small amount of the dosage which is suggested, even though the composition matches uh, RH1, uh, one But then you're supposed to give a lot more of that and, and I'm not too sure if that works very well with them. They all have a lot of symptomatic issues with taking them. So I do give them, uh, when there's an active AMD in a patient, we do give them as, but I personally feel it's more of a placebo or, or it's more of, I'm not sure if it makes a difference. I think these patients who are going to develop blindness in other eye, but trying pranayam and uh, deep breathing exercises, because it is basically related to the noxia. Like he said, yeah, anoxia, everything, yeah. everything, anything which can give him hope. More oxygen, yes. And then which, whether, how much it works. Not wine, not, not wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Manish. Thank you. So we have the second uh, question. It's, like I said, it's a hypothetical question. Is eye rubbing the real cause or it's a link or a hype? Manish. Sorry, Manish, pick up your uh, moment, oops, please. Just one minute. And we welcome Dr. Kuresh uh, to chair this session. Manish, I'm not opening it. It's <laughs> difficult to close with experience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Dr. Karishma Wadia has a very good practice in uh, Bombay. She practices cataract, refractive, and uh, cornea. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, there has always been an ongoing debate about who came first, the chick or the egg. Well, as ophthalmologists, we face a similar situation when we talk about keratoconus and eye rubbing because uh, we don't know whether it is keratoconus that is associated with eye rubbing or it's eye rubbing that actually causes keratoconus. Now, one person who really backs that is Dr. Damiel Gatinel. He says that eye rubbing is a sine qua non for keratoconus. So he totally believes in his mechanical hypothesis of keratoconus versus the previous molecular hypothesis hypothesis which says that there is an unknown collagen dystrophy. It's of unknown etiology. He says there's no unknown etiology. It's only one and only one thing which is eye rubbing. The eye rubbing may be caused by multiple factors but if you don't have, so he has a paper which says no rub, no cone. If you don't have eye rubbing, you wouldn't have a cone. And he even correlates this eye rubbing with the side on which the patient sleeps, the ocular, the dominant hand which the patient uses in his daily life other factors like dry eye, allergy, etc. So there are more papers to back this, which uh, talk about how keratoconus, allergies, itching are correlated with that particular dominant hand in that particular patient. So the eye which has more keratoconus correlates with the dominant hand of that person. And uh, there are also multiple studies about immunoglobulins in these patients being high. Uh, the team from Narayan Nitrala and Dr. Rohit have a particular paper on allergen-specific exposure associated with high IgE levels in these eye rubbers. Now, there are a lot of studies that have already been done extensively in keratoconus to tell us that um, allergies lead to high matrix metalloproteinase 9. MMP9s can be controlled with target-specific molecules like cyclosporin and attenuation of lysyl oxidase in uh, patients who are predisposed to keratoconus. But the main thing that we are looking at in any mechanism underlying the keratoconus pathogenesis is the first step, which is the atopy, which is usually associated with eye rubbing. 
So uh, I would like to thank Dr. Rohit for sharing his data with me. They have a study on the association of serum and tear IgE levels in keratoconus patients with and without allergic eye disease. So all these patients were subjected to clinical evaluations, topography, a tear analysis, and a serum analysis. So apart from tear IgE values, what was also measured was the inflammatory levels of IgE, interleukin-4, and interleukin-13. Now let's take a look at their results. In IgE levels of uh, patients with keratoconus without allergic eye disease, the levels of IgE directly correlate to the increasing grades of severity of keratoconus. So the higher the grade of keratoconus, the higher the IgE level was. If you look at patients with allergic eye disease, all of them had high IgE levels, but there was no real pattern in different grades. And uh, if you look at the tear biomarker profile in patients with or without allergic eye disease, they had high inflammatory molecules. The keratoconus patients with or without allergy had high IgE, had high IL-4, as well as IL-13 as compared to controls. So we know that serum and tear uh, IgE is high. That possibly causes the rubbing and the allergy, which is increasing the inflammation possibly causing collagen degradation, and that is what leads to keratoconus. Now, let us discuss these uh, two cases particularly, looking at the clinical implication of this entire study. So you have two patients. One is an 11-year-old male with a grade 3 keratoconus and a pachymetry of 410 microns versus a 15-year-old male with a grade 2 keratoconus and 490 microns. We all know that usually these younger age groups have some amount of allergy already in them when they present to us with keratoconus. And also we need to keep in mind that these patients progress much more rapidly than others. So if you are going for a cross-linking, when should you go for it? Should you go in for it immediately? Should you wait? Of course, you will first assess what is the severity of allergic eye disease in them. And typically, we would start them on a battery of medications like steroids, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, cyclosporine, tacrolimus, all of that. Most of these patients may come under control. There is still a subset of them who do not come under good control or they go into remission and then they might recur. So why is this happening? Why are some of them progressing and why not? Now, when we tested the serum IgE levels of these patients, these two in discussion, we saw that the levels were significantly high. A normal should be less than 300 when these patients had 2,700 and 1,730 international units per ml. Keeping this in mind, an immunologist opinion was taken. And the immunologist performed a patch test and found an offending agent for each of them. The first case, there was a sunflower allergy. The mother was using sunflower oil in the cooking for the child. And in the second case, uh, it was a sheep wool allergy because of using of sweaters and woolen clothes. Now, Particularly for these two patients, what we first did was we avoided the offending agent and the allergen. So in one case, we stopped the use of sunflower oil, and in the second case, the offending agent stopped wearing the woolen clothes. In addition, you have to give your oral antihistaminic treatment, and these patients were also given sublingual immunotherapy by the immunologist. Both the patients had a significantly reduced allergy after that treatment. So how is this applied to our clinical practice? If you have eye rubbing, atopy, and asthma, you already have a high serum IgE. High would be anything, like I said, more than 300 international units. For these patients, we possibly should look at or should think about giving an immunologist's opinion because we'd be able to find out an offending agent, which we as ophthalmologists may not sit and be able to do that in our OPD. And that offending agent needs to be avoided. Why? Because we want to wait and then cross-link. And why do we want to wait? Why is it important to treat that IgE before cross-linking? In this, we already have a paper by Dr. Rohit Shetty and his team. Now, lysyl oxidase has been studied by, this, uh, by them. And what the paper says is that lysyl oxidase is an endogenous cross-linker. In a patient of keratoconus, this lysyl oxidase is reduced. So, you want to treat a patient and get a successful outcome. If the lysyl oxidase is reduced, which it is in the presence of inflammation, you are going to have a failed cross-linking. So that is why possibly one patient who undergoes cross-linking has a good outcome, whereas another patient is still progressing even after you have a cross-linking. 
So what does the future hold? We would ideally want a point of care kit where just like you have a blood sugar level, you get uh, a test which tells you your serum IgE versus your tear IgE levels. And that possibly could help you screen your patients and decide who you want to send to the immunologist or who you can manage yourself. So this debate is always going to be continuing about keratoconus versus eye rubbing. And I would like to thank Dr. Rohit uh, for this data and his team. Uh, thank you, Karishma few questions which arise from your excellent uh, uh, talk. How close are we, how, how correlated is the serum IgE to the tier IgE? I know you all are doing the tier IgE levels, but how correlated are they? So they are increased in both the groups. The serum IgE is high as well as the tier IgE is high in both these groups. Can you do only a tier IgE and assume therefore that the serum IgE will be high and treat according to just the Sharma strip uh, measurement of the tier IgE? I don't think we should only keep that because we are wanting to look at the systemic evaluation so that we can start systemic treatment because we're anyways giving topical treatment for the patient who has allergy on the basis of his clinical symptoms. So we should look at something beyond what we can see. Sir, uh, just to continue from what she said, uh, the serum Ig allergy is a systemic problem. It's not a local issue. Even if you have a patient coming to you with VKC, we only treat the eye, not looking at the systemic issue, which is going to be a very wrong way of looking at it. Because there is systemic issue, but there is also a trigger of a local issue. That means you are, if you have an IgE of say 3000 in the systemic, your IgE in the triers will be maybe 4000 or 1500. This is a small variation, but it's always higher. So what we have seen, like she said, is in the normal person, it correlates quite tightly, but in an in a allergic patient, based on what his allergen is, for example, you and me, both of us have allergy, and our allergens or not, we are sensitive, maybe you may be sensitive to this flower, I may be sensitive to this uh, leaves, so that allergen is different. So based on whether you are living in a garden or you are living in a flat, then the allergen specificity increases and that's when we get local changes. No, I, I agree. What I'm trying to say is I'm just trying to eliminate doing a serum IgE at all. I do a tear IgE, it is raised, I send him to an immunologist who does the, uh, or somebody who does the patch test for allergy and treat. Both you need, sir. Both you need. It's both you need. It's like uh, getting an RBS and FBS. Okay. So you, you they titrate your allergy based on both okay. of them. Any questions for Dr. Karishma? So, what about Monte Locust as a non specific uh, anti allergic, anti inflammatory? Absolutely. We would be looking at the entire spectrum of drugs that is available. And like I said, because we don't want to, while sitting in our OPD, apart from giving your topical treatment, if you want to give these drugs, you would ideally want an immunologist. So it is an ideal case situation where you could refer it to them and they will... See, Monty Lucas, what, she, what happens is, if you have a very non-specific allergy, it works very well. But you have a specific allergy. For example, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, but both of them, both of them have the same thing. Like example, I'm allergic only to this plant and I have this whole garden in my house with this plant. Then your anti-allergics and even steroids don't work because you have to take this plant off or you have to have a, uh, you have to bring in that systemic immune, ther immu immune therapy for that. Uh, I'll just, just, to, just to qualify again on Monte Lucas and anti-histaminic. See, whenever you have an acute attack, it's the antihistaminic which brings you down. Forget the allergy. Just imagine a common cold. Somebody suffering from a huge cold, you'll give him an antihistaminic. You will not deny that. But somebody's getting frequent colds, I would put him on a three-month course of Monte Lucas 10 milligram at night. You see, the idea is that you can give it as a chronic thing while you don't normally give an antihistaminic as a chronic. So if you're not going to do the immune uh, the studies, if you're not going to do the patch test, find out the specific allergens as Rohit said. If it's going to be a non-specific allergy that you're treating with, and the patient is bad, you can give a three-month course of Monte Lucas, topped up with antihistaminics as and when there is an acute attack. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No itching, no keratoconus. Huh. 
yes so there would be some patients who uh, have uh, no history of keratoconus why is uh, oh history of keratoconus no history of it. So what yes. you're saying is they have history of keratoconus, but they but don't, they don't rub the eyes. And the, the patients who have this keratoconus without rubbing of the eye are the ones who are genetically predisposed. So there is one uh, particular population who is rubbing their eyes and develops keratoconus. There is one who is not rubbing their eyes. So why is that population still developing keratoconus? Those are the ones who are genetically predisposed. There is, comes your genetic hypothesis. Or if you listen to a person called Gatinel ever, he, he will, he will yes. convince you that everyone rubs their eyes everyone. if they have keratoconus, whether you have seen it or you have not seen it. Invisible, at night rubbing, or the way he turns his head on the pillow and sleeps, that causes irritation. Means he's, this gentleman is firmly convinced that it's 100% yes. uh, rubbing which is the cause of keratoconus. We don't go to that extent. <laughs> we go by what Karishma is saying, which makes more logical sense, that there is some protective gene which uh, which is there in some and not there in all. See, um, my colleague, uh, we did a study, we took every patient who comes to a clinic who has a high of eye rubbing, we took uh, a different videos of how they rub the eyes. It's very interesting how you rub your eyes actually drives your progression. Somebody may say, I rub my eyes every day. I don't know whether she has that video. I'll see if I can pick that video. There are some people rub it with knuckles. There are some people rub it. Some people are very gentle with the rubbing. So more the force you get, the more the progression it is. So it's just not eye rubbing. It's also about how you, how you do it. But Severity of itching is dependent on what is your allergen. For example, I'm sitting, like I said, again, I'm going back to the same analogy. I'm sitting in the garden all the time. It's going to reach all the time if I'm allergic to that. So that means what her take-home point in this whole meeting is, in this whole talk is, that treat keratoconus as a systemic allergy issue also, even though they don't have other systemic like asthma and other things. And please work up these factors, especially in a child who comes to you. We don't need IgE for all the people who walk into your clinic. It's a pretty costly test. Mm -hmm. But at least the children less than 14 years who come to you, please get it done and you'll always find that they have something or the other which can be avoided, like those two cases what she mentioned. And if you don't avoid them, if you do a cross-link, if the allergen is there in the house, it's going to create problem all the time. The only time I tell them to not to avoid something is if they have a pet at home, if I say that you avoid it, many people can abandon or just make the pet orphan, which I don't want to. So otherwise, we can, we have to be a little forceful on avoiding certain things. Sometimes perfumes. Uh, Rohit, what about uh, topical cyclosporins? Cyclosporins do work uh, because uh, cyclosporin, now we are talking about uh, chloroquine. All these drugs have an act on your T-cells. So these are, a lot of them are T-cell mediated uh, uh, release and, uh, and anti-allergics are your lower stream downstream and the lowest downstream is the mediator that's the mast cell uh, release so you look at the upstream these two drugs are upstream and both of them have a very good role in uh, earlier I used to use cyclosporin now I use chloroquine because it is cheaper and it's giving it doesn't sting as much as the cyclosporin is Um, it's because of the environment and food we eat. The question was why is it rapidly progressing in children? I said children, if you go to meet a pediatrician, you'll, you'll, they will tell you that their asthma is increasing. The bronchial, uh, if you go to the dermatologist, the dermatologist will tell you that eczema is increasing. Children in our country are getting more allergic uh, hypersensitivity to allergy. That is not in ophthalmology. You go to all these branches. If you, I have a pulmonologist who said last five years, her in number of children coming to her with asthma problem has double or triple. So it's 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 the, because your allergy is increasing, everything else is going to increase. That's because our environment is changing. So the effects of your uh, you know your your pollution, your global warming, everything is slowly creeping up. And it is, we are seeing it ourselves. Yes, exactly. Chloroquine drops works again on the immune modulator. It's an immune modulator. 
So it is working on the same little different pathway than uh, cyclosporin, but it's more compatible for especially in the children because for an allergy, 0.05 percent what we use for dry eye doesn't work. At this point of time, UV lube is the only one which is available. UV lube. UV lube. Uh, it's an acute acting drug, so at least twice a day for four months. And after four months, it's be, it's, you know, it's more of an acute phase, so you have to stop it. Ketorolimus. Tacrolimus. Yeah, uh, uh, that also works. See, this is a part of the armamentarium. You can use 2% cyclosporin, but that again causes a lot of burning and stinging. The, the tacrolimus, the ophthalmic ointment is little better tolerated. Earlier we had only the skin ointment which we used to put outside on the skin and hope that at night it would seep through and give results, which it does do. But now you can put the, at least I use the Orolab, no financial interest, but the Orolab tacrolimus is, the, I find it better tolerated in the eye. Uh, I put it in the eye at night for patients of allergy, for patients of SPKs and it seems to do tolerate it fairly well. But how long will you, because it is Three known, months again. Yeah, it's known, tacrolimus for indefinite use is no. not ex advised no. because it's known to cause uh, changes. It could even cause cancer because it's like, it's, an, it's, an, it's the double-edged sword. So, like Sir said... Not more than three months at a stretch. Tacrolimus is more potent. More potent, you have to use it to probably the last line because... Uh, uh, or Twice a day chloroquine or once at night tacrolimus. Yeah. Which one, sir? It's in low strength. It is available in low strength. Two strengths. Entod is making one, if I remember. Entrac is the trade name. Other one is what there, you there mentioned. Are, as an oral lab has tacrolimus, then there are some other telemus by Ajanta Pharma. And now there are many other companies also making it. Basically, there are a lot of drugs in the market, but we'll have to taper it to what is this. It's more of a bespoke approach. And uh, that is how we need to take. So finally, what do you, what do you think? Is this the eye rubbing or it which came first? <laughs> Just to end it. First came the keratogonus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd like... I, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty. Oh, you yeah. want Sushma? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Sushma to tell us about, we move away from eye rubbing to progressive vision loss with normal intraocular pressure. I love the question mark afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning and thanks for the opportunity. I'll try to do justice to the forum of this meeting. Well, uh, my topic is progressive vision loss with normal intraocular pressure. So do we have the answers? Uh, well, uh, there are certain facts that all of us know about a normal tension glaucoma that IOP is the only modifiable factor, but we do have, we do see glaucoma and the progression even with normal intraocular pressure and there are certain other factors that we need to look into. Well, it's a multidimensional disease, so there are multitude of factors that we need to look at, whether it is BP fluctuations, non-IOP related factors, vascular factors, neurodegeneration and even the measurement errors. So I'll just take uh, the highlight on few. Well, uh, if we look at the non-IOP re uh, related factors, where comes the systemic sis uh, problems, that is hypotension, sleep apnea, vasospasm, and uh, even myopia, cardiac issues, and things like that. I'll just give you a, an example. This patient presented to us with se for second opinion for glaucoma with 6-6-N6, pressures being normal, PACI being slightly lower side, and open angles. She showed me the field that she had done in 2004, which was perfectly normal, and even the GDX done in 2004 was normal. Well, this was her discs that we saw there, and if you see, there are larger discs, superior inferior rim being equal, so uh, maybe early sign of glaucoma in the right eye, but more importantly, if you see that vaso uh, constriction there, uh, that was quite striking. Well, when we did the fields at that time, she did show superior arcuate defects and even the GDX showed worsening than what she had the reports with. We also did an HRT because the images of GDX were not so good. Well, HRT also, also showed corresponding changes uh, in the right eye. Left eye was beyond uh, the uh, disc size, so we did not consider that as significant on HRT because the size of the disc was more. 
well uh, we did a full day dvt and readings were more or less below 18 so normal tension glaucoma of course but what we did as a customization as we saw that arteriolar narrowing we gave her dorsalamide and also took her for a physician work up and yeah, we sorry, found sorry sorry what is dvt a uh, full day diurnal variation of the pressure i'm sorry so um we found out that she had high cholesterol levels especially the tga and she was started on statins along with the physician she is still on follow up with us and is quite stable uh, the cholesterol levels are also under control so interestingly uh, those are the things that we need to look at and that let me come to the measurement errors now now some of the patients who present to us like this can also have normal iop which we think is normal but we may not be measuring it well they may be having a weaker corneas which may be uh, showing us the lower iop than it actually it is well to look at it in detail we looked at a uh, uh, number of glaucoma patients using a viscoelastic model and almost 1000 patients of glaucoma and then as we got wiser we excluded some patients where we understood that the biomechanics is affected by systemic diseases topography changes refractive errors so all those patients we excluded and looked at the normal uh, kind of patients uh, but having glaucoma which were age matched and cct matched also because those things can also affect these uh, biomechanics and using this particular formula we looked at the corneal stiffness is this patient in these patients and we figured out that there is a lot more to look at we only keep getting uh, thinking about the cct and the iop now if you look at the biomechanics in these patients or the stiffness is significantly different between uh, angle closure group and the open angle group group which is largely driven by the anterior chamber depth so what this brings us to is uh, the correction factors that we need so we could actually calculate the correction factors both for angle closure glaucoma and open angle glaucoma which can be added in a formula and can actually give you the actual iop and to make it more simple when we have this uh, correlation with the anterior chamber depth you may not even have to have an expensive machine to look at the bi biomechanics but you can also look at the anterior chamber depth and can predict what are the mistakes that we are getting in iop measurement so that may be the future another case a 60 year old gentleman with family history of glaucoma again the normal pressures uh, open angles this suspect i saw him in 2015 with the normal feels and we did the oct also because the discs were so large and everything was all right he presented to me again on in 2017 and this time with a disc hemorrhage on a uh, optic nerve and as we did the visual fields we did find say early changes uh, corresponding to the disc hemorrhage and the oct also showed us the uh corresponding change so this patient has been on follow up with me and developed glaucoma after say 3 years so again the diurnal variation test that we did to ensure this is normal tension glaucoma and what what is my usual practice is that i also check the bp so when we check the bp uh, we found out that uh, she he has nocturnal hypotension which is what is causing the damage so we treated him with the anti glaucoma and as well as to avoid the night dose of anti hypertensive so we modified the treatment along with the physician and that would help we have a study of our own uh, group of patients where when we looked at the uh, diurnal variations of these patients you are you can actually look at the peaks that you can get so you can actually rule out primary open angle glaucoma almost half of them and when we uh, look at the bp variations quite number of patients that means 9 out of 27 normal tension glaucoma patients do have nocturnal dip and 3 out of 27 also had carotid artery disease which were uh, and those were treated for that as well so it is very important to look at these things when we are talking about ntg last but not the least when we come at the pathology we have to look at where the disease is starting so we did a molecular profiling of these glaucoma patients to understand where is the problem now when we do trabeculectomy for these patients we did collect the trabecular meshwork and iris in these situations and looked at the rna extraction in qpcr so as to look at what are the fibrotic markers and what are the anti fibrotic markers expression in these group of patients so that we can do uh, sort of uh, there you know uh, we can establish a pathway where we can look at the subtype and progression and when we looked at that just to give you an example if we look at the severity we found that tgf beta r2 was uh, which is a pro fibrotic marker was higher in severe uh, group of patients and the anti fibrotic marker that is ifn beta was significantly less in severe group of patients so there are these markers which are strikingly there and can predict sort of severity of the disease so by looking at that we can actually uh, predict maybe the outcomes as well in future with these fibrotic markers 
So the idea to look at all these things is that uh, glaucoma being a multidimensional disease, we need to look at the answers to each of these questions so as to understand it better so that we may get the answers in future and may be able to stop progression in these patients. And NTG eventually may turn out to be ocular manifestation of a systemic disease. Thank you for your kind attention. If we can go back to the previous slide. The, yeah, I mean, uh, this is what I was uh, discussing <clears throat> with Manish also, that, you know, it is something similar to your ARMD where, you know, we are looking at one arm of it and trying to connect everything to it. So, if you uh, add, uh, you ask this question, if you add uh, multiple factors, then at least, and like this, each disease has pathways like this, or this is just the tip of the iceberg maybe. The each disease, if you can look at it, then only then I think we'll get that markers, uh, which is what we call it uh, very elusive at this point of time. No, uh, uh, another thing that I've found that ever since, what the, what the mind doesn't know, the eye doesn't see, so very correctly when you pointed out this is the last only couple of years I have been actually asking patients with uh, normal tension glaucoma about their sleep habits. More, more importantly, I normally ask the spouse because the patient sleeps very soundly, snores away to glory and has no knowledge of their uh, uh, sleep, apnea. sleep apnea. And you talk to the spouse separately and the spouse says, yes, I, I mean, I've got used to it, but it, he snores like a battle tank. And then I've, I've actually referred these patients to the sleep specialist. They have put that uh, CPAP machine on and monitored the whole night. And they have documented this and then have shown it to the patient. And we have put the patients on CPAP machines. It's, a, it's a, uh, about 50,000 odd rupees is what it costs, maybe less now. But uh, now you get better sleeker machines. They sleep with that on. There's no snoring. There is a positive oxygen going in and somehow it uh, tends to stabilize their uh, visual field patterns. So uh, it's something which we can all uh, implement. When you get a patient whom you're convinced is glaucoma as far as the fields or the disc, and there is no obvious rise in pressure, do check with this with the spouse. So do you ask them specifically about the sleep apnea and uh, these yes. parameters? And if yes. it is uh, there, do you aggressively treat them? Yeah, actually I send them to the sleep clinic that we have in sure. Narayana Hridalya and they do the sleep study on them. They also check the oxygenation pattern in them when they have that sleep apnea episodes. They put them through like how we have diurnal DVT, a diurnal variation. They look at the oxygenation pattern throughout the night. This is for all glaucoma night. patients? Uh, no. Angle sleep closure. apnea st study I do only for patients who give history of uh, snoring or okay. uh, waking up in the you night. Ask, you need to ask. Yes. Dr. Manish, even the, uh, I was reading about, uh, or this one of the nanos meeting, uh, uh, sleep apnea, because this is a very interesting uh, question you raised about sleep apnea and snoring. They said that progression of diabetic retinopathy and when you have a BRVO, CRVO, the chance of other eye in five years increases in a person who has uh, more sleep apnea. So do you also follow in your clinic or should we? Uh, yeah, there is a lot of uh, uh, data which is coming, especially in relation to occurrence of CRVO and all. We know that it occurs early in the morning. Uh, it is known to have also associations with AION. Yeah, AION is, all is these very much. Are known uh, with people who take antihypertensive pills in the night, they tend to have a fall of blood pressure. So, all these things are related somewhere, I feel. So, we do try to elicit history, but have not gone on to the level of getting their sleep. Uh, the Be ischemia check. being the common factor yeah. uh, in yeah. both the situations, I think uh, all these things would apply there as well, like yeah. Renaud's phenomena, sleep apnea, nocturnal sure. dips, in both these situations. Uh, the good thing is earlier you needed a sleep lab, now you don't need to send the patient to the sleep lab, the technician comes home, yeah. just puts the mask on and the readings are taken the next morning, like a Holter monitor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For AIONs where the antihypertensive is linked, we always uh, advise the patients to take antihypertensive pills in the morning and not in the night. So, so that definitely I think all of us have started doing now for some years. Yeah, because it is there is a very well established connection. Swan Singh Here uh, had proved that uh, it occurs much more often early in the morning and for the people who are taking antihypertensive pills in the night. No, those are on antihypertensive medications. Yeah. But one thing I would uh, like to suggest for you is, because you're doing a lot of imaging markers, 
uh, for various conditions. If you can ask, put in a questionnaire in your study, uh, the one presentation you mentioned about history of sleep apnea or history of snoring or history of, uh, I mean, of course, we take our history of taking medications at night or morning. Yeah. So the, based on that, if you can let us know probably next year, do you see any vascular changes? Because you do work on FFA and OCTA. Right. So because like she said, the vessels should change in a person who has apnea versus uh, because there is so much of chronic ischemia in him. So that could be a good marker. To understand, yeah, sure. We'll definitely look into that. Thank you, Manish. Anybody else has questions? I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Kuresh to give Dr. Sushma and Karishma both because we miss both of them. Sushma. Thank you. My topic, uh, my, what I'm going to speak today is about uh, Indian drug invention. It's not truly an invention, but we just, uh, my specific to my topic, it's just that an idea given by somebody which was already there and how we started looking at uh, different areas where it can be used. These are my financial interests. I have also worked with uh, FTC on this product. However, uh, I'm sure I'll try to keep, I uh, have no financial interest in that, only that it's the passion of uh, trying to get this drug into this market. So why do we need anything new? It's because our definitions are changing every year. Uh, this is a DUS2 which has come out, they keep adding new, new stuff all the time and we need to tackle these new things what we get. And now this year has been about neuropathic pain, you know, people who are unhappy with the uh, with your pain post-surgery. So most of the time, I'm not really sure how much the, the people who are making the definitions have really gone into the depth or it's just a lot of work done by, by the different groups. They have added this together into, a, into this uh, definition. So we really don't know how much it's really uh, been studied. So we get these new drugs, which is uh, commercially, which are available in the market. Now we spoke about acrolimus, we spoke about restasis, Zedra is a new thing from Shire. You have to understand that they all act at different pathways. This is how, you know, somebody has realized, okay, this is a cyclosporin, it blocks this receptors here, it blocks this uh, uh, a molecular signaling, which reduces the inflammation, so this will work. Tacrolimus, yes, it acts on a different pathways. Uh, then you have the Zedra, which acts on a T cell ICAMP pathways. This ICAMP is also a well known pathway in uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy. <laughs> the question is not all the patients have this pathways abnormal. Some of them may have one abnormality, but you are using the same drug, it doesn't work. Some patient may have this one, but you're using the restasis, it doesn't work. This one slide explains how limited uh, we are in understanding where each one of our drug is working. Because in the broad spectrum, when we, somebody says, what is restasis or what is tacrolimus, what is Zedra, it's okay, immunomodulator. But these are not steroids. They don't modulate everything which is uh, there in your immune system. They are very specific. When you have a very specific, it's a chance that it may not work on the other side also. That is one of the reasons why you have a lot of drug non-responders today. So when we look at looking at any unusual pathways, this is the pathways uh, we studied. The inflammatory molecules, the pro-nociceptive. Pro-nociceptive fibers uh, factors are the same whether in the skin, your scalp, more the pro-nociceptive, it increases your hypersensitivity. It makes you sensitive to everything. And anti-nociceptives are protecting. They help you to block it. And I'm going to come to what autophagies and nutrition, genetics, your environment, what you eat, how you live, and what kind of a mental state you are. All that can trigger off all these changes out here. And these are all the uh, potential areas. This is what I wanted to show. These are all the pro-nociceptive. And each of your nerve fibers have a receptors. And the anti-nociceptive actually blocks it so that it doesn't really go and reach these receptors. 
when you have these receptors going and hitting your uh, these receptors, you have the depolarization, hyperpolarization of those nerves, and that's when you start uh, getting the pain and other stuff. So the question is, we all know from this, uh, you know from a lot of example, case example, what we see in a clinic. But we don't have anything which is perfect. I'm sure we'll not have also in future because it's impossible to make something called perfect uh, medications, which we have to keep evolving. So how do we design one? When we started looking at designing uh, medication, it has to be targeted. See, the question, the role of, uh, a, of a bombing everything, like a nuclear bomb therapies, I think is going to go off. If you, there was a time anybody has any cancer, you would get a chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and multiple combinations of it. And uh, patient will survive, but the collateral damage would be so much that is, he looks completely dead. His skin, hair, everything is gone. So last five to seven years, the entire cancer therapy has gone into a genomic-based uh, therapies. They do a gene test, they look at which one are you susceptible to. Not all drugs works on everybody. And then they target it so that you don't target them unnecessarily to everything else. We have learned, I think we should learn from those therapies. I think this, this is what you mean by a targeted drug delivery system. So one of the areas where we wanted to look at is was autophagy because autophagy became quite well known because of last uh, 2016 uh, Nobel Prize. And uh, what happens really is when they have an inflammatory molecules coming and hitting here, these are all the cells. It damages those cells. The cells started secreting a lot of unwanted dead particles. Autophagy is nothing but housekeeping system of your body. These are all the dead particles of the cell. So in the cell, you form an autophagosome, goes into the nucleus, and then it lyses. This is what happens every, every second in our body. And once it clears off all the dead and unwanted stuff, what you have is you have a cell which can regenerate or repopulate. But when you have that autophagy being uh, non-functional, what happens is it just stays there and imagine uh, uh, no housekeeping and how much it would sting. The, exactly the same thing happens in these conditions, especially in chronic condition, uveitis, uh, uh, retinal conditions, a lot of retinitis pigmentosa, many, many areas it's been known to work that way. So when you do any research of any kind, this is how it should be. And this, uh, you have to have an idea about what you need to start off with or where you want to start off. You have to create an experimental model. You have to keep proving it. Like, like Sushma said, or Dr. Manish, even one small area it's like a normal tension glaucoma or one drusen in your ARMD. The concept of it is same. And in this case, we looked at building a lubricant from starting from here to how do I bring it to a patient uh, care. So the idea was, I told you, the idea was from what would probably be, the, we probably should start from the top because the end products are what we are targeting. Like for example, you're looking at a mast cell stabilizer or steroids, it's a downstream. Already so many factors have already made it to release. So we thought we'll start from the top, we'll clean up the, the, the mess out there on the top so that when it comes down, we don't need to worry. We can use any, even a lubricant to clean it up. So previously in the golden era, what it was done is you try it on human beings, then animals, then different cell lines, but I think the drug delivery for the future is going to use uh, induced pluripotent stem cells because then you don't need to trouble animals with your very complex experiments which makes them, it's, it's not ethical also. So this is how it's going to be. In this case, we did not do it, but I'm just giving an example how the future would be. So when we come, just to summarize this, uh, I don't want to go into the, all the steps what we did. When we look into any ocular surface disease, these are all the pathways which works. And like I said, you asked about why is it increasing, is because the environment, the inflammation, because all these factors change with stress in your environment. What you eat to where we go and how do you sleep, everything changes it. All these molecular pathways, many of which I can't even pronounce, are the ones which drive 
every disease. So each and every new drug tomorrow or today is trying to block one of them. Like for example, this is a genetic pathway which triggers off a lot of cell wound healing uh, changes. So one of this major controller of inflammation which many of the drugs work on is NF-kappa-B. This is a transcription factor which kind of controls, it's the godfather for all the inflammatory molecules. So when you, when you have all this, like you look at this, you have stress, you have diet, infection, obesity, and addiction to something, you trigger off NF-kappa-B. It is nothing to do with ocular surface. It can be your retina, it can be a glaucoma. If, when, you, when you start looking at cell biology, you'll see more and more it's a godfather. It's, in fact, it's necessary to, the reason we are leaving is because of this also. It's a double-edged sword. But when you become excess, when it starts inducing more of the problem, then you have it. Because if you don't have an inflammatory molecule in your body, we die. Inflammation is necessary for keeping us alive because it keeps us balanced and it keeps us in a state where everything is balanced. Only that imbalance is a factor. So this is not bad. It is good. It's very good. But excess amount of it is where it actually triggers off. And because of change in your autophagy and the mechanism, this starts changing. And that is why this got Nobel Prize because they, he mentioned that this factors, changing the uh, autophagy, would change a lot of factors in your body which makes you from a normal healthy cell to an abnormal health, then you get your cancers and other uh, pathologies. So when we started looking at uh, this new drug, when I said invention, we had to test it. Or like all our tests was done on the, on the lab model without animals. When you look at creating exactly the same state of FS, like what you see in a dry eye. Like that when you have a dry eye, this is a uh, immortalized corneal epithelial cells. That means they don't die. You can, create, you can do whatever you want on those cells. You can create stress, you can induce drugs. You can see it will act like it is acting on your own eyes. So you create a stress on the eyes, because, sorry, the epithelial cells, and you start looking at how would it behave if it was a dry eye. So you can see that inflammation increases. This is a typical dry eye scenario and autophagy. It, each one has a marker, like you want to look at sugars, you do a uh, random blood sh test, and each autophagy also has markers. These are genetic markers which we can study. So when you use these drugs, in, in, in our cases of the chloroquine drug, you know, you can see that the same cells, the, the cell line started behaving better because the cell started changing itself for good. It started cleansing itself for good. More of, so autophagy in very, very simple term is trying to make the cells more viable and it cleanse unwanted stuff and you can see the changes which is happening. And these are all the markers which shows that how it's working. So finally, why do we need to improvise? Why do we need to go into the market and help pharma companies to get new drugs? Is You have to tell them your problems. You have to tell them that a lot of conventional drugs don't work today. Lubricants don't work today. Steroids don't work in a lot of patients. Cyclosporin don't work in all of them. So when you talk to them, the industry also will start looking at whether we can do anything. And we can probably have, each one of us have ideas about what worked in your hands. And I think it's time all of you start talking to them and I'm sure a lot of pharma industries would be interested to have your ideas. That's how wonderful discoveries have been done. And these are all the group of people I would like to thank who made uh, this work possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. And uh, please come and accept a memento. I invite Dr. Natasha to come and share her thoughts on should we link topography to biomechanics? At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers and the chair for uh, giving us an opportunity to present some of our work here. Well, the intention of this talk is just to question, are we enough in our clinical practice today or do we need something more? So what are we doing in our clinical practice today? The screening modality has got these very robust ectasia or screening tests for refractive surgeries. Now, how do we screen our patient in clinic today? is by looking at a topography. Now this is what gives us 
a structural analysis. So let's take a case example. Now, the, she's a friend of mine, 29 year, ophthalmo 29 year old female ophthalmologist. This is a refractive error. She wants refractive correction. The best way to go ahead is do a topography. Now, if a topography looks something like this, with a superior inferior asymmetry and the thinnest point is slightly is uh, deviated to the inferior temporal region. How many of us, can we have a show of hands, how many of us would go ahead and do a refractive surgery for her? Go back one previous slide and show the refractive error. Uh, it was minus 1.75 with a minus one cylinder, approximately that both eyes. I'm scared to put up a number, but I would have possibly done it. <laughs> All right, so if, okay, now let's go to the Bell and Ambrosio display. Now, if you look at the total bag D here, it is 1.56, and the suspicion is 1.60. It's so close to abnormal. Would you still go ahead and do a um, refractive surgery? And if you look at the exclusion, uh, uh, the 3mm exclusion here, the enhanced display showing slight elevation here. So how many of us would still go ahead and do a refractive surgery? Dr. Maskati? I would still... Okay, so it's if a, if we error, yeah. uh, if if, if so this was not an ophthalmologist, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Definitely, if it was not an ophthalmologist, definitely yes. With an ophthalmologist, the hand came up ever so slowly. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else would differ from this? Anybody would want to say something on this? So you, how many of you want to operate on this? Jaya wants to operate. What would you do? Okay. PRK. Yeah, that's that's a very valid point. That's a good I point. would also, when I say operate, not a LASIK, a PRK for this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, why are we discussing this is because even though there are very robust screening uh, criteria, we are still missing some factors. Now, let me let me give us uh, let me just discuss this case example. Now, imagine these two blocks of same dimension. Which do you think is more prone for deformation, or which will bend or deform better, the first one or the second one? This, which will deform more with pressure. So iron is something that will not deform because, and the pine wood will deform. It is. It'll break. Yeah. It'll break. Well, any any pressure that would cause more change. Let's put it this way. Okay. She's asking is which is more flexible. Okay. If you are not trying to, I mean, even if you are not looking at breaking it, but would, what would be a more flexible one in this? If there's pressure and if, if there's pressure, if what there's any would pressure, change? the pine wood would just break. The right. iron with a lot of pressure, you'd be able to deform a little. Yes. So, so this is precisely if that would break, that is more prone for any change with pressure. So this is what exactly we are trying to translate. This is a innate property of any material. This is what determines the function. Now, function in clinic is determined by what is called as the Young's modulus. Young's modulus, if it is less, that means the corneal tissue is stiffer. If it is more, that means it's a more compliant tissue, which is prone for slow recovery. Now, how do we measure all this jagger in the clinic is by two methods. One is what is ocular response analyzer, which gives corneal hysteresis, which is not directly corneal biomechanics, but a surrogate marker and Corvus ST, which gives corneal biomechanics. Now, imagine having the structural data from the topography and the functional data from the Corvus and combining it together. Now, this is what we are doing in the clinic. It's called as a total biomechanics index. So this has been uh, initiated by Professor uh, Renato Ambrosio and group, where they compared different uh, methods of screening and they combined this uh, uh, biomechanics and topography and found what is called as the total biomechanics index and if you look at the ROC curves it is it is much more robust and much more sensitive and specific in screening these topographies now what it essentially does is it gives us the corneal biomechanics index in this form it gives us the topography the same way as the bad or the pentacam does and it gives us the, these forms. So this is the corneal biomechanics index from the Corvus. This is the bad D from the topography. And the total biomechanics index, which is a regression analysis of both uh, the uh, Scheinflug imaging devices. And it tells us if it is normal or not. So anything close to 1 is abnormal. Anything close to 0 is normal. Now let's look at this. If you look at this topography, uh, it's a symmetric bow tie. And uh, the, the topography looks normal. But if you look at the corneal biomechanics index of the same individual, the cornea is biomechanically weaker, which is why the corneal biomechanics is 
close to 1. If you look at the total biomechanics index, it comes into a very, very suspicious uh, zone. So this, although the topography looks normal, it is not absolutely a normal cornea. Now look, let's look at one more example. If you can go back to a previous slides, if sir, if you also look at, and all of you can look at this, this was, uh, these two slides were given to us by uh, Renato himself to me and uh, Natasha. If we go back, so to the next one, I don't know whether you put that slide. Next one, next, after this, after this. Okay, so what he says is, uh, next, what is the bad tea for this? Okay, he says that this case has got a very high, uh, I'm just trying to play a devil's advocate of a lot of mathematical stuff here. I would do a surgery on this because the topography is just an against the rule astigmatism. There is uh, Bacchus thickness, the, the, the corneal thickness is good, but he says that the biomechanics is abnormal for this eye and because of the biomechanics being abnormal in this eye the topography even though it's normal it's showing is on a red scale I mean we're just playing devil's advocate here so according to him you should not operate I don't know whether she has put the one more he had shown me one more where the topography ah, this one look at this it is for any refractive surgeon if you just put the it, it's a scheming of axis it is not the axis is skewed to one side. The thickness is okay, and it's there is some change in the percentage thickness factor there, which I would avoid if I had to avoid. Even this is okay to me, but even if I had to avoid, I would avoid this and not the other one. So the question is, even though this is a nice way of looking at an uh, for, of a new way of looking at an indices but it is going to create confusion till we understand what it is. Do you agree with this, sir? Yeah, if you look at the, I mean, all of us agree. If you go back to the, if you look at the previous one, this is a perfect one. It's an against the rule. Absolutely. And, uh, but it's biomechanics is poor. So you will have, if you, if I deny this patient, seeing that you're not fit for LASIK without telling or giving this report or somebody who does not believe in biomechanics, and somebody will say that you don't know how to read a topography. Yeah. So this is why these new indices, especially this particular case, highlights the fact, even though it is given by Renato himself, and he really talks about it a lot, but I asked him, and he says, in his case, he would do this. But if you have to do this, we'll have to probably stop 50% of our cases from exactly, operating. Exactly, because if it, if, it, if it comes down to mainstream, if this ever comes down to mainstream, you'll land up in so many medical legal problems. Every ectasia patient will go back and, and uh, sue you saying that you didn't do the uh, Corvus or uh, you didn't do the TBI. Yes. That's one of the problems with Pentacam, even though I've been using it for the last 13, 14 years, one of the first few first uses of it. Pentacam, when it goes to any legal, if you cross a legal side no. and if you have all these indices and somebody picks it up and says that there are, even in a normal person, you'll at least have three or four which is abnormal. Correct. And there is no published report what is normal and what is abnormal. So we end up in a big trouble. So Pentacam is actually, I mean, if, if to be very, very clear about uh, you know, doing any procedure, especially with this thing coming in. So I just wanted her to stop here because this is uh, Renato's uh, uh, patients. I just wanted you to see that even though people in this, even a lot of conferences, people talk really gaga over this, but we have to take it with a real serious note on whether it's going to be really useful. And in fact, we're quite glad that we had this discussion because currently we are discussing there's still lacuna in how we are measuring corneal biomechanics and how we are integrating it because it's quite um, look, the, the, the changes that happen in the cornea are quite localized and they're quite differential. This is what Briand microscopy does. So probably integrating this would probably give us much better knowledge on, on this. Now, in today's clinic, basically, how are we trying to measure corneal biomechanics? We may not have the tools to measure corneal biomechanics. So this is a very interesting paper which was published by our group where in, in pediatric population, they have correlated refractive error with corneal biomechanics. And what they've essentially done is not only correlated with corneal biomechanics, it's the total biomechanics of the eye because the collagen type of sclera and cornea is slightly similar. So on based on this hypothesis, what basically we did was we calculated on the 
total corneal biomechanics and we derived the deformation amplitude from the cornea. Now, if you look at different grades of uh, refractive error, we see that uh, higher grades of refractive error have lower, con have lower deformation or lower corneal biomechanics. It means weaker corneas, so, which is a surrogate marker for weaker sclera as well, which is why the elongation of the eyeball happens. Now, this was one of the discussions that had happened in one of our research meets where Sir had proposed this hypothesis, and this is what has materialized today. What is even more interesting is we are able to determine the elastic modulus of the entire eyeball and the cornea. So just by using these um, calculations, which although look very, very complex, these are simple calculations. Now these calculations are able to give us the corneal biomechanics theoretically by these two formula by just measuring the ocular biometry alone. So you don't need a corneal biomechanics. Just by these formula, we can sort of theoretically determine what would be the corneal biomechanics of the eye. So once you have that in your uh, thing, based on if you add this formula, then from your biometry, you can derive it. And this formula, you don't need to click in each time. If somebody can put it up in, the, in your machines, the machine itself will give you the formula. The reason it is important is that it is not just corneal, it is even in retinal cases because you are weaker the biomechanics of your whole sclera, the chance of things progressing and the chance of your lattice, your retinal detachment, every single thing is based on your scleral biomechanics. So because we don't have a new tool for uh, biomechanics, scleral biomechanics, this was like what she said, a surrogate marker which once we modulate, mod modify it, I think a lot of you can use it in your practice. Absolutely. So, um, this, all these data, however, is giving us a cross-section. What would be interesting is if we could teach our machines, as was discussed earlier, is basically by artificial intelligence and predictive models. So, we feed in all the data from prospective uh, cases and feed in the big data and provide a healthcare system where where the machines are able to predict if the patient is going to progress or is going to maintain or simulate how the surgery is going to look like. So this is what we are looking at for further uh, big data progression um, to understand how this artificial intelligence can be used prospectively into our clinic and help us improve our prognostication and diagnostic modalities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Please come and collect this call. Any questions? We have just two more minutes. Family history. Take a detailed family history. And I think retinal conditions have more indications today. But everything is, if, I mean, it's costly. That's why we can't offer it to everybody. She asked about genome studies, but every study, every case has a chance to be studied but retinal condition I'll put it because there is more retina work more genetic work has happened there RP is one area so macular uh, the, uh, the, uh, macular dystrophies these are all conditions where there are many which are where, where we know the genes finding gene the new gene is very difficult trying to study a known gene is cheaper sir thank you I think uh, just to sum up, we had an extremely uh, interesting session. Uh, we covered several what appeared to be disparate topics ranging from the, the ARMD to keratoconus to sleep apneas and uh, normal tension glaucomas. But I think basically all of this and to uh, uh, the pathway to newer drug discoveries. But basically this is all linked is our seriousness in trying to help our patients by a little bit of lateral thinking, not just going by what we've been taught, but thinking to ourselves. And the more you think about it, and it, your patients are your best teachers, we then explore working closely with industry to see whether we can separate the wheat from the chaff and come out with some helpful tips for our patients. I think this has been a learning experience this session, and we aim to repeat these sessions in future AIS meetings and hope that a lot of concrete stuff will come out, not from the speakers, but from the stimulation it provides to the audience at large so that they go home, also do this thinking process. You don't need big labs, you don't need all this, you just need to put on thinking caps and think laterally and see what we can do. 
Thank you so much for all your attention and for being here.